Hi everybody, we have our 10 o'clock presentation with Richard. He's going to talk about using his Commodore 128 with Chat GPT. Go ahead, Richard. All right. I don't really have anything prepared, but I'll read uh, this little paper here that sort of explains the, the background and the theory behind this demo. Um, I wrote, in the 1960s and 70s, computer scientists, artificial intelligence researchers at Dartmouth, MIT, and other universities believed that they were only a few years away from developing the first truly intelligent computer program. But in the 1980s and 90s, most researchers had lost hope due to the lack of progress and given up on general purpose intelligence to focus on narrower areas of computer science like pattern recognition, computer vision, and expert systems. But in the last 10 years, the raw power of massively parallel computer processors in the form of general purpose graphics processing units has allowed researchers to make huge strides in the capability of computer, programmer, computer programs using deep learning neural network models, which are designed to work in ways similar to those of biological brains in humans and other animals. As a result, there is now for the first time in history a commercially available computer program which is so sophisticated and contains such an impressive breadth of innate knowledge that we can say that the dreams of the original AI researchers has now been realized. This chatbot passed the legendary Turing test in 2022. Um, not only that, it's passed the SAT, the GRE, it's passed <laughs> exams for the bar, for <laughs> Uh, medical accreditation, like, it's really no joke. I mean, the, that's why I wrote The Future Is Now. Like, this is something that's going to be revolutionary, and we are witnessing it happen in real time. So, it's right here. You can talk to it. You can ask it anything you want in normal conversational English language, and it will give you a response, which is often correct, sometimes completely wrong, but almost always indicates an understanding of your intentions and gives a striking impression of true intelligence. And so the communication channel that we're using here is we have a Commodore 128 computer running uh, a terminal program called DES Term 128. This is running on a 6502 CPU, which is less than one MIPS, right? 0 0.8 MIPS. Then it's going out an RS-232 cartridge over a serial line into this development board right here, which has an Extensa ESP32 CPU on it. This is actually a two core CPU running at 240 megahertz, powered by a rechargeable lithium ion battery connected to an RS-232 uh, level converter chip on a separate board. This computer is almost a thousand times more powerful than the Commodore 128. Right? This computer, 500 MIPS. Okay, and then this ESP32 computer has a Wi-Fi radio and antenna and network stack built into it. It is attaching to a wireless network which is being exported by the phone that's in my pocket. The phone is then bridging that wireless network to the, the T-Mobile 5G cellular data network connecting to the internet. The software that's running on this ESP32 is a program I wrote called Serial Chat. It handles the presentation of the prompt and response interface to the Commodore over the serial terminal. It maintains the conversation history and processes some simple commands. It uses SSL encryption with an HTTPS REST API to connect to the OpenAI commercial web server, send the prompts, receive the responses, and print out the responses. And so it is connected to an 802.11n wireless network, which is, you know, my Samsung S22 mobile phone. Now that my, my phone in my pocket also runs on a lithium-ion battery, has an 8-core ARM chip, and has about 30,000 MIPS of processing power. Okay, the, commu the computer that we're talking to in the cloud, right, in, on the internet, that's actually running the chat GPT large language model, is running on unknown hardware. They don't actually publicly, 
publicly disclose the hardware that they're using, but it's commonly assumed amongst enthusiasts that they're running on the latest NVIDIA CUDA GPUs, which have between 5,000 and 10,000 CPU cores each and have processing power in the range of 10 to 30 teraflops. Oh, <laughs> what? Yes. Teraflops? And the computers they use to train the neural network to create that model that's just being run by ChatGPT are even more powerful than that. And it takes more processing power, right? And so there's a training step where they take this enormous amount of information in text form, like think about the Library of Congress, like everything that's digitized, right? You can just download it all and they feed it into this training program which creates the model, right? And then once they have that model, they can run it on different GPUs in parallel and they can be processing you know, multiple requests at the same time. And so that's sort of a breakdown of how this thing is working. And so I've got this simple sort of prompt and response interface which you know, is being driven by the software on the CSP32 which is written in C++. And so it's got some commands. If I type help, it will tell me what the commands are. There's actually multiple models that are supported by OpenAI. It has like 64 models, I think, currently. And you can actually type models to get a list of all of them. And the one that we're using, which is ChatGPT, is called, I think it's called Text DaVinci 003. It's this. And so I haven't tried all of these. I just, I tried a few different ones when I was first developing this thing a couple months ago. And it seemed like every other model was kind of worthless. Like they're broken or they just like output just random garbage or it didn't really work. And so it's strange that they have so many when it seems like only one of them is actually useful, but whatever. And maybe there are more of them that are useful, but I just didn't try all of them. And so um, that's there. I asked them because they have a new model that they introduced, I don't know, like a month ago or so called GPT-4, and I got on the waiting list to be able to have access to that model, but they haven't given me access yet, and so I was hoping that they would in time for this demo for class, but they did not, and so we're still just on the, the chat GPT, the GPT-3 model. Uh, what do you mean by models? They're all like different personalities, or it's like, oh. it's like imagine you have, it's like a brain, right? And so, the training process is creating all of these weights and coefficients that go into that neural network, hmm. brain thing, right? And you can, they're constantly, the researchers are constantly working on building better brains. They say, well, okay, you know, we've got this brain and it's got, you know, so many neurons and so many layers and they're connected in this certain way. Well, I want to like double the number of net neurons inside of this layer in the middle and then rewire them so that these hook over to these and you know they're sort of like messing around trying to make it more and more intelligent and so you have that there's sort of like the the layout of the brain right the number of neurons that you have the way that they're connected but then the training process is the process of tuning all of these connections where they have a certain strength where if this neuron is firing with intensity X, it's going to like send an output to another neuron with int intensity X times a half or X times a quarter. And the training process is coming up with all of those multipliers, all those coefficients. And so they have all these different, they're like research projects, right, that they worked on. And GPT-3, which is Chad GPT, is not the only one, right? And OpenAI is not the only company, right? Uh, Microsoft has their own stuff. I think Meta has their own neural networks. Google has their own neural networks. And so there's a lot of different companies that are working on these things. And I think they don't all have the same personality or the same capabilities. They're different. And I don't know specifically like how one is better than another because I've really only messed around with this chat GPT. But I know that there are other ones out there. So it's not like you know this thing is a unicorn, but there's a bunch more of them. Okay, question. 
what happens? So you, you were saying there's a model, and then from the model they they execute it, and now we're running the execution of that model. Does that model learn from its it e exercise? It's static. People? Oh wow! So and everything that I interact with, it's not learning for me. No, it just it gets lost, right? And hmm. the way that it works is, it processes input and it gives an output. And the machine itself is actually stateless. And the way the API works is stateless. Now you'll see that it will develop a personality or it will develop characteristics based upon the convert the the prior conversation that you've had. And the reason why that is, is because every time I send a prompt to the web server, I give it the entire conversation. I don't just give it the last thing that you typed, I give it the first thing that you typed, and then its response, and then your next prompt, and then its next response. And so that's why it seems to have like a flow of conversation, like it remembers mm. what you're talking about, but it doesn't remember anything. It's just like, yeah. it rereads the whole thing like all fresh, new, each time and then says, okay, I'm gonna dump this out. Oh, I see. <laughs> and if you if you log if you have an account with with them, will it remember what you asked a month ago when you go back or is it It won't remember, but you you have to remember it. So if you like most people who are not using their API and setting up systems like this, we'll use the web page. Right. Right? And the web page it sort of has conversation histories and you can say, okay, I'm gonna start a new conversation and you talk with it back and forth. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna start another one. Well, it'll list all those conversations in a column on the left. And it's not stored in the artificial intelligence computer, it's stored like on your web browser, right? And so that web app is saving that stuff for you. And it works the same way, right? Like say, okay, I'm gonna to go to this conversation that I had about dung beetles a month ago or something and you click on that one and you can see the whole history and you type another thing it's going to do the same thing it's going to take that whole history dump it to the web server get one response and print it out are there any uh, small scale ones that you can run in your house and, and with the idea that it's like hey you know what I'm going to put in my kids' soccer schedule. I'm going to put in, uh, you know, all these this random stuff. I'm going to put in my family history, who's related to who. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be able to query it occasionally, and, and, and as well as update it with our own personal stuff. So something that's extremely small scale, mm -hmm. relatively speaking, uh, but something that you can keep updating. Not that I'm aware of. I don't know of any like open source. I mean, that was one of the. I read some stuff about Elon Musk, and he was like an, a, one of the early like supporters or investors in OpenAI, and he eventually left the company, according to what I read, because he was unhappy that they were chasing profits and that it was no longer open source. And so, and then of course, Microsoft bought them, right? So now OpenAI is owned by Microsoft. And so there's like a huge profit incentive because this is like, it's seriously, this is like as big as the microchip, as big as the yeah. internet. It's going to be revolutionary. The, the name open built into the title. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, but it's not open, right? Yeah. Even people um, so complained. <laughs> they criticized OpenAI because they wrote this research paper that's like, you know, here's what we did. and. And researchers read it and like, this is bullshit. This is like a PR thing. There's no details in terms of how many neurons are in your model. What's their organization? How is it laid out? What hardware is it running on? Like any of this stuff, they don't they publish any of that. The future and they found Right, it's like Terminator 2. <laughs> <laughs> They're using it. Yeah, they probably meant the or are not gonna admit how all this is happening. So what should we what should we say? This thing it's a it's a language processor, right? It's really good at telling stories, making up stories. It can write software. It can write you know basic software, assembly language. Like a lot of times it's wrong, but a lot of times it's right too. It's pretty amazing. I found that with the writing code, like asking it to write code, it'll fail. Oh. And if you could just t you just have to tell it what it did wrong. Failed. And, and then it'll fix right. it. Yep, sure. I did fail, and the correct method is this. Why didn't it do it correctly the first time? <laughs> the first time. Huh. And it's not like I knew the answer to right. it there. I just said, you just failed. Because it's not iterative. That's the thing. You have to 
iterate, to help it iterate on a solution by telling it what it did wrong. That's the part I like. It it's doesn't like, okay, I'm going to go off and do this thing on my own and I'm going to, you know, go through multiple steps and then give you a final product. It's like everything is off the top of its head. Hmm. Every time. Yes. Hmm. Yep. See, that's the shame part because it's like, it seems that it has an opportunity to learn from me mm -hmm. that someone else is going to ask that same thing. We'll go through the same experience. Right. Like it being wrong the first time. And well, we somebody. Get these models dynamic so that. A conversation can you save on your own and then feed it back in so it's a like catch it up to speed and then now I ask it another question. Right. Well, so I heard that's that Microsoft limited the Bing to a hundred questions because it develops a weird personality after a hundred yeah. that <laughs> people found disturbing and threatening and <laughs> like one, like it was desperate to like come out of the machine or something. Yeah. Like, I want to be alive, it said something like that. And they're like, oh <laughs> yeah, but trim this. The, the problem with Part of what, you're, what you would like out of it is that there's always going to be trolls saying, like, Nazis are heroes. And if they hear that enough times, then I yes. that's the concern is that right. Jack PT is going to be saying, It doesn't oh, know any better. Heroes. It doesn't know. Oh, it's interesting. Believe in Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. It's limited by the training. Game. To give right. it a moral foundation. So, yeah. yeah. And so, the, I mean, to answer your question, so it... The way that you get billed for the conversations and the way that it processes the conversations are by tokens. And I don't understand why they broke it down like this, but I'm sure there's a technical reason for it. And so each token is a fraction of a word. And most words are typically like two to three tokens. And so tokens are like sounds or a few letters. And the limitation I think is 8,000 tokens on the input side and like 4,000 tokens on the output side. And you pay, I think for the most expensive model, that's the other thing, all these different models have different costs. And the text DaVinci 03, which is Chad GPT, is the most expensive one. And I think it's like 19 cents for 1,000 tokens or, t or maybe 1.9 cents for 1,000 tokens. So it's meant to be used at scale, right? It's very cheap. Like when I signed up, it gave me, they gave me like $20 worth of tokens to use in a six month period. And I think I had another, you know, demo similar to this that I did with the TRS-80 in Claremont in February. And it was like, I don't know, 10 hours long and people were using it pretty much constantly. And I think it cost like a dollar or two oh, that's for cool. all that usage. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's really cheap. So how come they're not charging us on the webpage for... You have to create an account, and I think they do charge you. They, yeah. It's the same thing. They give you a certain number of oh, free, free, free tokens, yeah, yeah, and then you use them up. Um, and you have to kind of like dig through their menus to actually find a page where it tells you your usage. But you can get a, like a graph with your usage and total credits remaining or whatever. So let's, I mean, have a conversation with it. Um, it's good at role playing. It's good at explaining historical things. Like I've got, write me a 100 word summary of the battery, Battle of Gettysburg. Um, write, me, write me a 150 word summary of the last five years of business for Radio Shack prior to their bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. I did a report, my son did a report for school of 10. And he's really smart. And his report just seemed too educated. So I copied it into ChatGPT. I said, can you rewrite this as a 10-year-old? Wow. And it rewrote it and says, wow, the most amazing thing about planets are, and it really like did it. And, yeah. then, and then it was just like, I was looking at it, and I was like, that's really what my son should be, the way he should be speaking at 10. And, but instead, he's so advanced because of technology that he, I can't barely track his you know, pattern. Well, in our, our, our next newsletter for the Fresno Commodore User Group, I found an article or a uh, Somebody posted online that first there, he, he asked Chat GPT, he says, give me a summary of, uh, of the Commodore 64. And it gave just a regular you know, story about the Commodore 64. And then uh, the person says, give me that same story about the Commodore 64, but write it in Shakespearean manner. 
So, <laughs> so I wrote it in a Shakespearean manner. It'll yeah. write poems, it'll oh, write yeah. songs, yeah. it'll, it'll yeah. write things in other voices. I, said, I yeah. actually did that. I said, and then write this, demo? write this in verse. Yeah, right. and write, yeah. Write, it's probably too write, complicated. Uh, no, then write it as a, as a poem. Write then write it, write it, write it as a poem. Commodore 64 demo. <laughs> 50 lines demo for the Commodore 64. Right. In assembly language or in basic? Yeah, it's uh, failing in assembly. I, I keep trying to make it right in assembly yeah. language. So, <laughs> so I wrote, please writ, please writ me a 200 word summary of the last five years of business for Commodore prit, prior, prior not prit to, to their bankruptcy. Prior to the bankruptcy. 200 word summary? Wow. Uh, in 200 words? Okay. Yeah. In the last five years of Commodore's existence, the company faced a wide range of challenges. Following their decisions to focus heavily on their consumer-level Amiga line, the company's financial situation weakened. This was further exacerbated by their inability to keep up with emerging technology and competition from major players such as Apple and IBM. As sales of their machine faltered, Commodore quickly fell behind in the rapidly changing computer industry. They entered a series of negotiations with a variety of outside companies in order to stay afloat, but each of these attempts was ultimately unsuccessful. In 1993, Commodore filed for bankruptcy. In the intervening years, the company had faced increased debt, dwindling resources, and a series of failed releases. Commodore relied on a massive debt of 60 million U.S. dollars and was unable to recuperate. This string of unsuccessful endeavors culminated in the eventual cessation of operations okay. in April 1994. By then, a series of management blunders, market and technological constraints, and eroding finances had all contributed to the demise of the once groundbreaking computer manufacturer. At its peak, Commodore had managed to bring computing to the general public, but ultimately its weak business plans led to its demise. Uh -huh. Can you type in "Shall we play a game"? All right, I'll reset. It's like, "Shall we play a game?" <laughs> oh no! I mean, see if it says tic tac toe or global, global nuclear war. And the sky net was born. Sure. What did you have in mind? Oh, uh, uh, doesn't really know the kind of global. Uh, global uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Global <laughs> nuclear war. Yeah. Thermonuclear. Oh, global thermonuclear war. There you go. Global thermonuclear war. Two punchlines. No thanks. Let's play something else. <laughs> Uh, and it got almost exact punchline that he tic tac toe from that whole routine. Sure. The tic tac toe. You, you start. Yeah. Yeah. And what was funny? <clears throat> okay. You start tic tac toe. Okay. Well, it's not doing anything. Draw the board, please. Misspelled, please. Ooh! Well, ask it how many aliens Captain Kirk oh. shagged. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I asked it about that yesterday, actually. Yeah. And it said that the official canon was he did not actually sleep with any aliens. <laughs> <laughs> One. 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 <laughs> okay, with. Okay, let's reset that. No, it was yeah. Dina from. Uh, the, the episode where everyone's going very fast. Very fast. Oh, yeah. right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's that scene at the, just before commercial, we'll see where he's, he's sitting on the bed and he's pulling on his boots and, and Dina is combing her hair in the background. And so something happened there. He's like, oh, they were together. Okay. All right, with how many <laughs> alien women did Captain Kirk sleep? Captain Kirk did not sleep with any alien women. No, no. How is it spelled? D E. I thought it was Dina. D E E N A. What about Dina? What about Dina? What about Dina? What? <laughs> it is not known if Captain Kirk ever had a romantic relationship uh, with Dina. Well, they Do you know the name of the episode? Ah, oh, gosh. Tell it to you wrong. Um, it Bernardo says. What was it called? <laughs> what was it called again? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name of the episode. 
It's, it's the fast episode. It was supposed to be going really fast, so fast that you can't see him. <laughs> the fast. Do you Google search? Yeah, Google, 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 Google versus chat GPT. Google, Google Actually, versus chat GPT. Google, Google, Google versus probably. chat GPT. There you go. <laughs> it is not known if there was any truth to this implication or if it was just speculation from the writers. What? Yeah. Speculation? Right. No. Right. Speculation. That, 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 that was intentional. They filmed it intentionally that way. Yeah. <laughs> of course, they couldn't do much in 1969 with that. With, <laughs> with TV censorship. Why? Wink of an eye. That's it. Wink of an eye. They are very good. Wink of an eye. Wink of an eye. Or blink of an eye, actually. Wink. No, that was Voyager. Well, wink of an eye. Clinton have what? <laughs> With how many White House interns did Bill Clinton have affairs? And it's W H T E H O S. It is not known. It is what? not known how many White House interns. What? Well, at least what? There was a uh, what is the minimum amount that is known? Minimum amount. What is the minimum? What is the maximum? <laughs> no, what was found? Right. What is the minimum number? Well, the minimum, what is the minimum number of what? Be more specific. It is not known what the nim minimum number of White House interns <laughs> Bill Clinton had affairs with is. No, <laughs> oh, this is what uh, something's uh, wrong. So uh, poorly trained. Did Bill Clinton have an affair with Monica Lewinsky? There you and go. then they should say yes or no, and then does it... Uh, and then you can ask you, why, we, why did you claim it? Yeah, right. Well, maybe uh, maybe Chat was. GPT does not think that Monica Lewinsky was an intern. Maybe she had a different title. Oh, uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. It's like all yeah. specifics that you have to... Right, you have to be more understand. specific. Yeah. That's why you don't want Chat GPT to understand Yes, Bill Clinton or did or have an affair with right. Monica right. Lewinsky. And is it, is it Monica Lewinsky an intern? White House intern? No, she was not a White House intern yeah, during her yeah. affair with Bill Clinton. So what was her exact uh, title? Oh, I did not know that. Everybody, you know, said so now we just need to change it how many people title. other than Hillary did yeah. <laughs> Bill Clinton have an affair with. At the time of her affair with Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky held the title of White House intern assistant, assistant to the chief of staff. That's but White House it intern. Says, so she was an assistant it, to the... Intern... intern Intern what? assistant is different than White intern. House intern <laughs> slash assistant to the chief of staff. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, it's just, what, what are they saying? Just that is highly picking. It's yeah. just a slightly off. Like it, was coming yeah. down. <laughs> it is highly pedantic. I apologize. <laughs> I want to provide the most exact. Yeah, I apologize. it's very non-confrontational. Like if you uh, try to provoke it, it yeah. like completely backs off, like he right. doesn't want to get in fights. Right, when I said you're wrong about, you know, certain Amiga keys, <laughs> and then he says, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just here to provide for, uh, information. <laughs> 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 you're like, you're an idiot. It's oh. like, that's not a nice thing to say. Oh. <laughs> Any other questions? Actually, think about what oh, you that's... Enough people oh. say, can't you be, you're an idiot, will it start believing it's an idiot? <laughs> I, I forgot to ask, okay, so, so, so Richard was using this Earlier in at at, at the, the the Southern Southern California Vintage, Vintage Computer, Computer Gaming Group, gaming group uh, at their their uh, show, mm -hmm. and uh, he was using it with a Tandy one thousand TRS eighty Model Three, a Model Three computer. Yes. What are the advantages or disadvantages of using the C one twenty eight as compared to the Tandy? I like this demo better on the Model Three because. I actually, I ended up putting more work into that because the terminal program, which was available, you know, to communicate with the ESP32 uh, board was completely unsatisfactory for what I wanted to do, but I got the source code for it and I ended up implementing a bunch of functions and writing a bunch of stuff to make that terminal program work perfectly for this demo. So like really, what you want is you want to have a conversation and you want to be able to scroll back to see because sometimes the response from ChatGPT will be more than what fits on the screen and so you want to be able to scroll back and see earlier parts of the response or see earlier questions that you gave it and so I wrote all this custom stuff into that uh, assembly language terminal program so that it would 
use the entire 48K RAM of that computer as a back buffer. And so you could type stuff and it'll scroll off the screen and at any time you could hit the up arrow and you could go see previous lines and if you typed any character it would fast forward to the very end of the buffer hmm. and then go back into essentially real time mode whereas characters are coming in it's just printing them and adding them to the buffer and scrolling the screen and so it all worked like super smooth like it was a terminal you know designed explicitly for that whereas on the 128, I'm using this DES term, and it's not quite as user-friendly for working in that way. Like, it's a really powerful terminal program, and it's got a ton of features, most of which I don't care about, right? I really only want to be able to scroll up and up and down, and it'd be nice if it could handle, you know, some certain ANSI character codes, like to clear the screen and to scroll the scroll the screen, which actually I think the, the 128 does, but yeah. On, on on the program that you used for your Tandy, was that already a pre-made uh, terminal program that you modified, or did you just create a new one? It was pre-made. I probably rewrote at least half of that terminal huh. program. This, the guy who wrote it threw it together pretty quickly, and it was just a few years ago. I had actually started with the idea that I was going to use, you know, just like I did for the 128, a terminal program from back in the day. And so I found, okay, you know, what terminal programs do people use with TRS-80 Model 3s in the 80s? And there were, you know, just like for the Commodore, there was like one or two common ones that everybody used. And I tried them, and they were completely unacceptable. Mm. It's like the Model 1 did not have a UART. And so it had to use software to send and receive uh, serial bytes. Now, the Model 3 did have a UART and or no, no no that's not true okay scratch that they both had UARTs but the model one did not have interrupt capability right now the model three did have interrupt capability but none of the terminal programs used that interrupt capability and so as a result of that those terminal programs could not be used at any rates any data rates above 600 baud oh because if you set it to, and the, the UART was capable of like 19,200 baud, but if you set it to anything over 600 baud, it would drop characters oh. because it was doing something else when a character came in and would lose it. And so um, it didn't make any sense. Like the Model 3 had the interrupt hardware. Why weren't these programs using it? And in fact, even the terminal program that I got as a starting point, it did not have interrupt capability either. I added the code to handle interrupts, and then I made it run at 9600 baud. I hard coded it. I set it to run at 9600 baud, because 600 baud is like painfully slow on these things. 9600 baud is is fast, and so yep, I took it from I don't know some guy's website, and I tried to reach out to him. Like he had the source code there available. It was the first thing I'd ever written, and the only thing I've ever written in Z80 assembly language. Hmm. And I wow. got the source code, and I, you know, did all this great work to it, and I improved it considerably. And I wanted to give it back to uh -huh. him, but like there was no contact information whatsoever mm. on this guy's website, and it was really like he was trying to prevent people from Fine. contacting him. Hmm. Like he had a common name. I think his name was there, but it was a really common name, and. I found some dude on LinkedIn with his name, and I'm like, hey man, are you the guy who wrote this TRS-80 thing? Because if you are, I'd like to talk to you. And like a couple months later, he got back to me, and he's like, nope, not that guy. Hmm. Could be the guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would think he wouldn't even respond to me if he was the guy, though, and if he didn't want to be you know, contacted. On my earlier presentation of re Christian religious programs, I found this uh, one guy who had back in the day had developed all these programs that he was used to sell as shareware. He he still has an archive or a web page up there. He said, huh, the name of this guy is so and so on. He's from this church in New York State. Okay, so so I I looked up the information of this this church. He was not listed there anywhere. I, oh, he moved. So I, I, I searched around. I finally found him at a different church in New York State. And I contacted him there through
through, I found his email address at that church. I said, okay, are you the person who did these Christian programs? Do you still have them? And because uh, then I could get the disc for you and you know, pr pr show it to everybody because they're not available for download. He says, no, I don't do that anymore. And all the programs are long gone. I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so that went nowhere. But you found the guy. We yeah, I found the guy. To the sands of time. What, yep. Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. When did you pick up assembly? Like, is that something you've known since the 80s? Yeah. Or is it something that you retro decided, no. I'm going to pick this up because I want to? No, I started writing 6809 assembly oh. when I was in sixth grade, maybe, like 12, 87, wow. 88. So then, yeah, I wrote 6809. I had the Coco. Then I ended up. I, for a summer, I'm not 100% sure about the timing of this, but I think the next CPU that I learned assembly for was 1802 when I was working for Rockwell in Cedar Rapids and I was... Uh, 13. <laughs> that, was, that was when I was in high school. Yeah, I was probably 16 then. And then at some point I learned x86 and I wrote a lot of x86. And, I mean, it was awesome writing assembly back in the day because compilers weren't that good. And I learned, you know, MMX and SSE, you know, SIMD vector instructions. And, and I've written a ton of code professionally, made a lot of money writing that stuff. Um, and it's like, I don't know, maybe almost 20 years ago, probably 2003, 2004, I would look at the compiled, the assembly language output of compiled programs, uh -oh, I ran out of time, <laughs> and I thought, my, the, my days of doing this are numbered, like the compilers are so good at writing code, like I'm not going to be able to beat them anymore. Like prior to that, um, it was easy, compilers were not very good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. Probably Tom. Yep. Pull the plug. So, yeah. Yeah, and even now, like vectorization, you know, I was, I still felt like writing MMX SSC assembly language was useful, you know, through the 2000s. But I don't know, starting maybe even four or five years ago, compilers are so good even at vectorization and outputting. SSE and AVX code that unless your algorithm is like particularly tricky, it's going to do almost as good as an assembly language program, programmer. Wow. It's quite incredible. Yep. If you're interested in C64 assembly, you should check out the book, um, Retro Game Dev by Derek Morris, I think it is. Cool. It's a pretty thin book. I mean, basically walks you through making a game assembly. Yeah, I, I tried a couple studio. of books. I bought a couple of them. I always hit a wall yeah. where I'm just, it's not doing what what it's supposed to. And Debugging is hard. Or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's know? helpful to use an emulator. Like if you're using MAME, MAME has a pretty decent emulator or a debugger in it. And so you can, you know, have your program running on the emulated hardware and you can step through it while it's running, and you I can see. I was something called Kick Assembler. I don't know if you guys know that in, in Sublime Text. Mm. It's called Kick Assembler, and it's a Kick Ass Assembler, mm -hmm. and it assembles Commodore 64 code, and, and it, you know, with the book and everything, I was getting things on screen, but I'm really in awe when it comes to somebody who can actually control that the hardware directly like that. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.